Thanks for your patience. We were having a little bit of technology issues, but we are very glad that you are here at Moral Mondays, Iowa. It's the first Moral Mondays of the year, so if you've been here before in past years, welcome back. If you're new, welcome uh, to being here. And um, we are going to start the year off with an um, interesting conversation about the death penalty. And I'm very glad to have each of you here. Um, also glad to have several legislators in the room. We have Representative Langston, we have Representative Kurth, we have Representative Casino, we have Representative Hunter, of course, Representative Anderson, former, rep former senators. <laughs> um, former senators. Former Senator Grunstall. Um, and just yeah. really glad that you're all here. Um, we have Tom Chapman with us from the Iowa Catholic Conference and then Representative Marty Anderson from Des Moines. I will let you know next week we're going to, I should have said, I'm Connie Ryan, sorry about that. Yes. Um, from Interfaith Alliance of Iowa and we have to organize Moral Mondays each uh, week. Um, next week we're gonna talk about um, guns. So we're gonna Ooh. go from the death penalty to guns. Um, and particularly the, the gun amendment um, that will be back on um, the radar again. Um, and then also just um, other issues around gun safety. So you'll um, look for information about that. If you are not on our email list, make sure that, make sure you sign in regardless, but especially if you're not on our email list, we send an email out each week with what is coming up. Um, and then um, you can know um, that you wanna be here. So anyway, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom Chapman. Well, thanks for the invitation to be here today, Connie. Um, I'm the executive director of the Iowa Catholic Conference, and we're the public policy group for the Catholic bishops in Iowa. I'm also a member of the group that's called Iowans Against the Death Penalty. And Iowans Against the Death Penalty has been around since 1962, and they were very instrumental in promoting the repeal of Iowa's death penalty, which finally took place in 1965. And since we abolished it here in the state, it seems like this issue comes up at the state house every decade or so. And or every year. Or every year, it seems like right now. So we're, we're back in that cycle again, apparently. Um, actually, Iowa carried out less than 50 executions in its history, you know, between 1834 and then 1965, which is very little when you think about in the country, we had about 16,000 executions yeah. since then, you know. Um, actually, Iowa was one of the more populous states in the late 1800s. We were in the top 10. So we just continuously have not had a history of using the death penalty a lot, even when we had it. Well, and you know that um, 156 individuals have uh, nationwide have been exonerated from death row. Um, so that is, for every 11 executions, there's one exoneration. So that's my one of my primary reasons to oppose the death penalty, even, be, even though I'm a victim advocate, crime victim advocate, I oppose the death penalty because um, we, might, we might execute the wrong person. Can't go back on that. You can't go back on that. Absolutely, and this year so far we've seen one bill that's been introduced, it's House mm -hmm. File 62, um, introduced by Representative Wheeler. And it calls for a penalty of death by injection for first degree murder. Mm -hmm. It's been referred to the House Judiciary Committee, which is chaired by Representative Holt, who actually last year, and Marty will talk a little bit more about this, said he supported the death penalty in theory, but then he had great issues with its practical and prudent and fair application. Yes. So we'll see what that means this year. But we've, told, we've also been told that we're gonna see a bill in the Senate as well. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Um, I thought we'd cover just a few points, and Marty had one, uh, why we, as a, for a society, we don't think the death penalty is really a good idea. And then I will talk a little bit about how the Catholic Church looks at this, you know, just to give you kind of a perspective from that, from that angle. But um, obviously in Iowa, is, Iowa's different than a lot of states in that the death penalty is not necessary because when there's a, a conviction of first degree murder, those people are in prison for the rest of their life you know, life without parole. So they're not getting out. So there's really no need in that sense to protect society further than putting them in prison. And a lot of people don't know that in the state. They assume murderers can get out. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, an important point. As Marty said, you know, people have been exonerated while on death row. Uh, according to a study I saw from 2014, at least 4% of those people who are sentenced to death are actually innocent. Um, 
those are mistakes that can't be fixed. You know, in the United States, we've done, we've been doing somewhere between 20, 25 executions a year. And if you do the math, um, you know, at least one or two of those people are likely to be innocent. Once again, mistakes that cannot be fixed. We should also ask ourselves about who are we executing? There's racial bias. More than half of the people on death row are people of color. Mm -hmm. More than three-fourths of death row defendants have been accused of killing white victims, even though African Americans mm -hmm. make up half of all homicide victims. Right. There's a bias that affects those living in poverty. Almost all people in death row were not able to afford their own attorney at trial. So if you, so if you, um, regardless of your race, if you kill a white person, you're more likely mm -hmm. to go to death row than if you kill a black person. Mm -hmm. Whether you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, um, and that's really troubling. You know that that bothers me because. Over the years, we've had so much trouble with our juries not really reflecting mm -hmm. our community makeup. And um, I mean, I know that there's racism and I know that it's implicit and sometimes it's um, unconscious. Yeah. So I think, I think we have to be really careful with what we do in the justice system that's final. And African Americans make up 13% of the population in the country, mm -hmm. more or less, but almost half of the people on death row. And actually, we've seen that here in Iowa, just with our regular you know, prison system without the death penalty, African Americans make up about 3% of the population, but over a quarter of the people in prison. You know, um, uh, Justice um, Blackman said something pretty, uh, where'd it go? Here it is. Justice Harry Blackman in 1994 said, it should not surprise us that the biases and prejudices that infect society generally influence the determination of who is sentenced to death. Mm -hmm. That was a US Supreme Court justice. What we see is also a geographic bias. Um, and this is a, we can get you the references for these things. This particular mm -hmm. one's according to the Death Penalty Information Center. But 2% of all counties produce 56% of the death row population. 2% of counties in the United States make up more than half of the death row population. And so I think that talks a little bit about prosecutors' discretion and what parts of the country you're in, whether mm -hmm. you're likely to be on death row. We shouldn't criminalize mental, mental illness and intellectual disability either. A study in the Hastings Law Journal found that over half of the last 100 people who were executed were diagnosed with or displayed symptoms of mental illness. So that's a big deal. And finally, as Marty said, you know, the use of the death penalty is a very long and costly process for the mm. state, and it would be much more expensive than doing what we do now, which is to put people in prison for life without parole. So examples of that are that um, in North Carolina, it costs $2.16 million per execution, more than what it costs for a life sentence. In Texas, it's $2.2 million more for a, an execution than for a life sentence. And in, just speaking about trials in Kansas, um, the typical trial costs $100,000, a death penalty uh, trial costs four hundred thousand dollars, so it's a very costly thing to be doing, um, where we can make mistakes. Exactly. And then uh, finally, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the perspective of the Catholic Church on this and where we're coming from. Uh, you know, we talk in our world a lot about the dignity of the human person, and that doesn't mean that people are dressed nicely or they have good manners. When we talk about the dignity of the human person, it means everyone was created by God and is exactly equal in that way. So that's how we look at this issue. Every person has dignity. Um, our position uh, from the Catholic Church certainly has evolved over the past decades, you know, and has become much clearer in our opposition to the death penalty. Uh, last year, Pope Francis approved a revision to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is kind of the book that has a lot of the church teachings. Who saying is that the God? death penalty is inadmissible, yeah. right? 
Uh, the Pope said, all Christians and people of goodwill are thus called today to fight not only for the abolition of the death penalty, whether legal or illegal in all its forms, but also in order to improve prison conditions with respect for the human dignity of the people deprived of their freedom. Now, obviously, it's been difficult for members of my faith community, for sure, um, some members, to admit that these inmates, in spite of the horrendous uh, crimes that they may well have committed, are still human beings. But our human dignity does not rest in our innocence, because, you know, really, who of us is innocent, right? But we are all created by God. Hmm. So this is kind of how we bring our religious perspective into it. I'll just conclude with a couple points and then turn it over to okay. you, um, just in terms of what you might be able to do to help. Uh, first thing is, I encourage you to join Iowans Against the Death Penalty. It's $15 a year, and you can go online to iowansagainstthedeathpenalty.org to join the organization. They send out action alerts on the bills and other bills as they start to move, so that's one thing you could do. Another thing is just to let your own groups know what's going on, that this is still a live issue at the legislature and we expect to see additional bills. And then contact your legislators, your own legislators, and see what they say about it. And here's the question I think would be most helpful to ask. It's, do you oppose the death penalty? Just kind of try to get a yes or no just answer down, on that. Yeah. Just up or down yes. And you'll be able to find very quickly if they're open to it or, or maybe we're not sure if we like it or not. If you don't hear, yes, I oppose the death penalty, then that tells you something right there. Mm -hmm. And then as you find that information, if you might be willing to let Connie know about that, that might be helpful for the list that we are keeping just to try to find out where people are on the issue. So that's the main thing I wanted to talk about today. I don't know, Marty, why don't you go Wait, ahead? I'm glad to fill good in. Good points. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it, the death penalty being a deterrent. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about Iowa in specific, specific to the death penalty. And I would like to, uh, in my final seconds, I want to address the issue of how victims feel about the death penalty. So it's not a deterrent. Um, that's what we all think kind of uh, logically that the death penalty is a deterrent. Um, that people wouldn't kill because they know that they might be killed. Um, but that's not true. In 2016, the murder rate per 100,000 in states with the death penalty was 5.63. In states without the death penalty, it was 4.49. So that's more than one point less in states without the death penalty. I think sometimes we find that uh, when we're looking at criminal justice that states with the harshest um, uh, sentencing and the harshest laws um, are places where uh, people are harsh anyway and they commit more crimes. Um, a 2009 study of criminologists revealed that over 88% believe the death penalty is not a deterrent. And the murder rate in non-death penalty, non penalty states has remained consistently lower than the rate in states with the death penalty. So that's one of the big arguments I hear about the death penalty, and it's, it's just not borne out. The data tells us something different. Um, why would Iowa go backwards when the trend is to eliminate the death penalty. Um, 31 states don't have the death penalty. Of the 19 states with the death penalty, four of them are under a moratorium with the death penalty. So that reduces it to 15 states that are still active with the death penalty. Um, I think you mentioned how many people we've uh, executed over the years but just between 1976 and 2015, 1,414 people were, were, um, were uh, executed, and 156 were exonerated. So people will tell me they, don't, they can't find anything in the, in, on the internet about anybody ever being exonerated, and, the fact is that people have been exonerated. Um, hopefully, 
um, before they're killed. Uh, let's see. So in the world, only 56 of 195 nations use the death penalty. The U.S. is the only Western country still using the death penalty. And as you said, we had 48 executions in the years that we had the death penalty, the 131 years we had the, the death penalty. 48 executions in 131 years. It's not the Iowa way. Um, in 1965, the Iowa legislature voted to abolish capital punishment with the help of Iowans against the death penalty. Um, my husband's been a member yeah, of that group forever. Um, but the House voted 39 to, 20, to 29. Only 70 people voted. That's kind of weird. They voted 39 to 29 to abolish capital punishment, and the Senate voted 35 to 20 to abolish. So it hasn't been the Iowa way from the beginning. Um, I'm going to read you a quote from uh, Governor Robert Lucas, who was our uh, territorial governor. And this was in his annual message to the first territorial Gen general assembly. He said, the general conclusion of some of the greatest statesmen and philanthropists of the age has been that the general policy of all criminal laws should be to prevent crimes rather than to inflict punishment, and that all punishments should be inflicted with a view to reform rather than exterminate the criminal. In these conclusions, I heartily concur and would wish to see confinement at hard labor for life substituted in all cases in lieu of capital punishment when suitable prisons for the purpose can be had. That was our first governor. So I, I think it's, it's just clearly not the Iowa way. Um, and I do get asked sometimes, because I worked with the families of homicide victims from 1981 to 2011. And I have to tell you that some of them support the death penalty, and some of them do not support the death penalty. Some of them don't want to see any more death, or they might know the family of the offender, and they don't want to see the same thing happen to that family. Um, some of them are opposed to the death penalty for religious mm -hmm. or other moral reasons. Um, there is a group called uh, Homicide Victim Families Against the Death Penalty in the nation that does a lot of work on this issue. So um, I had to decide where I stood on this because I worked with these folks. And I just decided that I, for all of these reasons, that I could not support the death penalty. And my clients knew that, and they understood that that was my personal stand, and that I didn't judge them if they had a different opinion. So with that, I guess we could open it up for questions. So we just take turns and raise our hand, and we'll start over here. Yeah, the, yeah, go ahead. The House didn't change their rules. No. The Senate did. But that, so if we senators. get a Senate bill, I don't know how they're going to handle it. I would think that they will have subcommittees. I'd be surprised if they didn't, but it's something to watch. And when you talk about public uh, hearings on it, are you talking about a formal public hearing, or are you talking about the subcommittee where people can come and give their opinions about a bill? Subcommittees? The House will still have subcommittees, the same way we always have. Mm -hmm. And it is the one time that the public 
and the lobby yes. <laughs> gets to come and, and, and tell us their stand and their position on things. So they did change the rules, but they have um, but made voluntary. the commitment to yes. still notify and still make them public. And so we're going to hold their feet to the fire mm -hmm. on that. And the groups that do lobby on it will make sure that people have it as best, have the information as best we can. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. More questions? Oh. Yeah. So the comment that you just made about the holding people to the rules, They're making it public. Is that just on the Senate side because yeah. that's where the controversy is? Is that what you're referring yeah. to? Yeah, the yeah. Senate changed rules, yeah. but the House did not. Yeah. yeah. Everything's public in the House. It's the people's house. <laughs> Sure I can. Um, the more expensive things in a in a death penalty case, and you can jump in sure. here, um, are that y usually you have to have two attorneys assigned to the offender, and and attorneys cost money. Um, trials are usually longer, um, and the sentencing hearing is often longer because in a state where you have um, the death penalty, in general, they first have a trial to determine guilt or innocence, and then they have a trial to determine the, whether it's the death penalty or not. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, those things make it expensive. And what else do you no, think makes it expensive? That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the process is much longer, and the appeals go through the entire process. Mm -hmm. It just ends up being a lot of lawyer time. It takes um, an average of 14 years between conviction, or maybe between sentence, I back up on that, between sentence and execution. So for 14 years, there's appeals going on with two lawyers appointed to the, to the um, offender and, uh, and the specialty of having a, a, a death row and the officers in the death row have to be specially trained. Um, I think you would find that in a great part, most people who work on death row do not want to have the death penalty. I mean, they spend 14 years with this person. You know, they find the humanity in that person. Uh, they want that person to be in prison forever. And, and have the death penalty of dying in prison. Rick? Yeah, so thank, first of all, thank you for having this to be in one of these. It's so helpful to highlight these important issues. Thanks to the legislators for coming out and taking time to, to speak today. It's, it's really helpful and interesting. Uh, my question really goes to who are other groups that would be um, opposed to the death penalty. And I'm thinking particularly other faith groups mm -hmm. uh, that we could cite as evidence. I'm also thinking about other law enforcement. Do we have sheriffs or police chiefs in Iowa that are opposed to death penalty and, and would go on record to talk about that? Maybe the Innocent Project. I know the Innocent Project's been involved in mm -hmm. uh, DNA evidence and, and uh, yeah. helping uh, to get people out of off death row. Mm -hmm. Other organizations that you're saying? We'll leave that to the lobby. Yeah, well, there was a good group of people that were up there to talk against the death penalty. There were very few that talked in favor of it. And I think what you'll see with some of the law enforcement people is some of that is more not in public, but behind the scenes, yeah. you know, work that's done with legislators. But I mean, I think the people who are in this room and the people who get this email are probably the core group of the people who are working against it. But, and it's not entirely um, partisan. No. You know, obviously, you've got you've got some people on both sides of the aisle who will go both ways on this, and so that's why it's important for people to hear from their own constituents and get a straight answer, um, because there's a lot of reluctance to go down that road. But there is obviously this keeps coming back, so it does appeal to a certain um, to a certain I would say legislators that are looking for uh, believing that this is justice. So. You know, last year we had the death penalty bill in the Public Safety Committee, and um, we had a hearing. And to my recollection, 
Nobody came to speak for the death penalty. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not one person came to talk about the, in, in support of the death penalty. And when push came to shove, um, we never ever even voted on it in committee because the Republican chair said that he didn't have the votes to pass it out. So it is mm -hmm. not a partisan issue. Mm -hmm. Um, I think people, you know, have their own consciences, conscience, they have friends, they have ministers, and so it didn't go anywhere last year because mm -hmm. could, they couldn't get it, they couldn't get it out of committee, the, meaning the Republicans. Jane, do we know where the governor stands on this issue? That's a good question. I don't. I, you know, I, I've heard not definitive answers kind of on both sides. I don't think this is one of her priorities. It, you know, I would say it's certainly not one of her priorities. Um, I've heard her say that she would be open to it in some instances, and then I've heard her exhibit some reluctance to it. So I don't think we have a straight answer. But imagine that. We have certain instances in which we would use the death penalty. So what would that be? Let's see, killing a child, killing a police officer, and what does that say to all of the other families of homicide victims? Oh, this, this life was worth more than your loved one. I mean, it just isn't, it, it doesn't work that way right. in my heart and in my mind. I think also in our conversations with her that we can tie in her commitment to changes in the criminal justice yeah. system. Oh, yeah. That's where I would. The reforms. Yeah, the reforms. This does not mesh with that at all. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. You know, it might be good for us, and I hadn't thought about this, to find out how many uh, people have a life sentence and what their race is. Life sentences by rape, or by race in Iowa. Um, maybe we should yeah, look into a, that. Yeah. Because, you know, nationally, we know that um, death row inmates are about half black and Hispanics actually uh, Fifty-four percent are African American and Hispanic, and um, so we know that that's way out of proportion. But you know, I, I think it goes back to that idea that um, that uh, Justice Blackman gave us that you know it's going to be it's going to be tainted by our our inside thoughts. I mean, there's, we, it's time for all of us to understand what our biases are. And if you have a bias, there's nothing wrong with you. I have biases, but I have to check them and make sure if they're influencing my decisions. And not everybody does that. Yeah. Back to that statistic for a minute, the one you just quoted of 54% mm -hmm. nationally on death row, of course, those are only in the state, 19 states. That have the death penalty. So that's the right. Thing, wow, that's thing right. What you want to know is how many people in those states, not all states, mm -hmm. are, de on, uh, are on are death row. life sentences, mm -hmm. what's their racial proportion? Oh, that's to a great that point. Yeah. Doing that a good national point. one doesn't yeah. work with that because you're taking states where it's automatically. That's why I think we ought to figure out the people that would be considered for the death penalty in Iowa would be people who commit class A felonies, which are um, uh, fir first degree kidnapping, first degree sexual assault, and first degree murder. And they all are heinous crimes at that level. So those I mean, would be the people that we need to see what, what that number is. You can see if the, if the percentage on death row and the percentage with life Senses were the same. I'll see if we can find that out. As yeah. I would expect. Thank yeah. you, Tony. That. But I don't know how That'd far. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chris. Uh, maybe just a quick point of clarification on the Senate. My senator is, is Brad Zahn. Uh, I don't know how he stands on it, but I'm guessing that he might be in favor. We, we actually have a first legislative forum Saturday, and he voiced his opposition to restoring voting rights for felons, which I think would be another great subject for a small amount. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. But do we know who in the Senate is would be behind this that we would begin to talk to about? Well, we won't know until they yeah. submit it. Yeah, right. It hasn't been introduced yet, but I mean, I've heard the names Julian Garrett and I've heard the name uh, Dawson. Okay. But beyond that, I couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do have notes on how people reacted last year, but I just think, it, I don't think we take anything for granted on it, for sure. Yeah. And actually, we are doing voter, um, felon voter rights later in February, mm -hmm. so you'll have to be back for that. Patty. Just on Brad Don, uh, last year when I talked to him, he talked out of both sides of his mouth. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I don't really know where he's at. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. Other questions or comments or, yes. Uh, just a clarification on one statistic. Um, did you say that 54% of the people on death row Nationally, come from two counties? Yeah. Yeah, 56% come from two counties. Two counties or 2% well, count of counties? 2% two, two of, count two of, of counties. 2% of counties. I'm sorry, 2% of counties. 2% of counties. Right. Yeah. Not two counties. Right. That's what 2%. I thought, yeah. I don't know and how many. They were mainly in um, actually uh, California, Texas, and actually Arizona was in there really? from earlier. Yeah. Wow. Again, the states that have the death penalty seem to have. And it's geographical rates. within those states, yeah. depending upon who's in charge in that jurisdiction. In those states, do they allow the counties to decide? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's how it's brought. Yeah. Good, yeah. So, in terms of effectiveness um, in arguing against this, um, in terms of the legislators, It doesn't the hurt. Or the, I don't know if you call it the moral aspect. Well, or, I mean, I know you probably need but to we're, depends. Holt, what, we're, what were Holt's? <laughs> well, it depends. Really wanted to yeah. you know, like Representative Holt was very clear publicly about he looked at how it was being applied and that seemed problematic to him. Yeah. Um, the in, in the proportions and also the fact that people were, seems clear that they were executed and they were innocent. And that's a big issue for legislators. They don't want to see that happen. Many I, don't. I would think the cost, mm -hmm. um, the mistakes, and the disparity would be in, most in, effective. Yeah, and, it, and there's been a couple people that are, I, I would say, they, they look at themselves as being um, not big government people. Mm -hmm. And I look at this as the ultimate big government the ultimate. bill involved in every process all the way to the Supreme Court, life and death. And for some people that actually is, a, that moves them. Yeah. Other, yes, please. So in 2005, this was before the Judiciary Committee in the House. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there was a play at the Des Moines Playhouse called The Exonerated being oh. performed. So if you can even just read a copy of it, it's a wonderful play that talks about this. And it gives, I don't know, four examples of people who are, who are up against the death penalty and what happens to them. But it's a wonderful play and it really personalizes some of the arguments that have been made. So I would encourage you to look at that. Thank you. That's great. Any other? Anyone else? All right. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here on Moral Monday. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here. Thank you to Tom and Marty. Thank you, Tom. Um, come back next yep. week, same place, same time, and we're going to talk about guns. So there you go. Oh, goody.